So we are now joined by Anthony Flacaveno. He is the co-founder of the Rural Urban Bridge Initiative. He's also a farmer and author based in Virginia and a two-time Democratic candidate for Congress in Virginia's 9th District. Anthony, thanks for joining us. Thrilled to be with you, Jen. Thanks. So as I had just mentioned, uh, you are the co-founder of a relatively new group called the Rural Urban Bridge Initiative. Um, and I, I want to talk about the rural urban divide, right? Because that can mean a couple different things. But I think what comes to mind for me immediately is that it's very well known that Democrats currently dominate in cities. Uh, cities are overwhelmingly Democrat. They're sort of starting to take over suburbs but they struggle in rural areas. So there's kind of a political component. And then, of course, when we talk about the rural-urban divide, um, a lot of kind of, I think, cultural issues come to mind as well. So you obviously have been writing and thinking about this subject for a long time. As I mentioned, you yourself are a rural resident. So what do you see, at, how do you define the rural-urban divide to begin with? And what do you see as kind of the main sources driving this divide? Sure. and. It's it's a, a fairly extensive list of things driving the divide, but we've, uh, myself and my colleagues at Ruby have kind of narrowed it down to the top half a dozen or so underlying causes. But we see the divide, first of all, more fundamentally as an economic divide. Yes. Uh, and, and cultural, I'd say, is pretty foundational as well. The political divide, in my thinking, has mostly followed from the economic and cultural divide. So... When when we do our trainings and write and speak about the rural-urban divide, we always start with an economy that has failed at least 80% of Americans. We yes. talk a lot about the top 1%, but actually the top 20% have done pretty well through most things. But the bottom 80%, the mass of us, have not done so well for a lot of reasons, from the complete uh, abrogation of our responsibility around antitrust and how uh, corporate monopolization has taken over almost every economic sector, uh, to terrible farm policy, to uh, investor-driven trade policy, and on and on. Now, that's failed most working Americans, most Americans across the board, but it is particularly catastrophic for the past four decades or so in rural areas, because rural areas have tended to be much less diverse economically. Mm -hmm. Whether they're a kind of a manufacturing sort of so-called Rust Belt town, whether they're more agricultural, whether they're like Appalachia, where maybe they had coal, timber, and tobacco, we've, we've been much more <clears throat> concentrated in the economic uh, basis. And as a result, these bad economic policies that have hurt everybody have devastated rural communities. To us, that's the starting point. Yes. We know there's lots of other factors, but when the, the economy has essentially abandoned you or just extracted from you for generations, you're pretty predisposed to get pissed off. And unfortunately, the, on the political side, the the right has been way more effective not in solving the problems of rural right. communities but in speaking to the anger and the frustration whereas on our side sort of somewhere on the spectrum of dems liberals progressives we've either pretended it isn't a problem blame the people who are angry because of their own uh you know parochialism racism whatever um or, or simply, here's, the, here's the, the most recent version, simply decided that all we have to do is use better messaging to convince these people that we're actually on their side. Right. And so all those things have kind of added up. Now, with the economic, um, the foundation of a, an economy that has extracted from and, and degraded so many rural communities and small towns, then you have the cultural differences that are real. Mm -hmm. um, also then become not just differences, but become flashpoints and become yes. further uh, fuel for the, the fire of the divide. I'll, I'll give you one example is around environmental policy. Now, I'm an organic farmer. Yes. I've been advocating for good environmental things for most of my life um, and in the last 10 years or so, particularly around climate change. But the message from our side about the environment to to rural places, and, and let's remember that it's the rural places that are most intimately connected to the environment, right? Whether you're fishermen, farmers, 
uh, foresters and loggers, even the drillers and the miners, mm -hmm. they depend on the environment in a much more immediate and direct way than most urban and suburban people do. We do in rural areas. Yes. And yet, most rural people hate environmentalists. So what? Why is that? How could that be? It's not because they actually hate the environment or that they don't believe in uh, conservation and stewardship of the resources. It's that they feel that all they've heard in relation to the environment is that they are the problem mm -hmm. and that what we have to do is shut down their mines, shut down their big ag farms, shut down their logging operations, and then we'll take care of the environment. Meanwhile, while we're getting that message, we know that all the people giving us that message still eat, still turn their lights on, still use wood and fiber and materials in their lives. And so it creates this deep resentment over people not really understanding just how challenging it is to utilize the environment to the benefit of people, but not to the de de detriment of the ecosystem. That, that's, mm -hmm. no, that's no easy proposition. Right. And yet rural people by and large feel they've been put in a place, kind of a no win. So right. that's that's one example about how the failure of the economy has then exacerbated the sort of perspective and cultural differences. Yeah. I, I want to follow that up with a kind of um, similar question, because I think that's something that we hear quite a lot is that, you know, there's there's a sort of condescending, condescending stereotype, right? That people in rural areas, especially rural uh, poor people, quote, vote against their interests, right? When they're casting ballots overwhelmingly for Republicans and you're rolling your eyes already. So, uh, so I was going to ask, how do you respond to this other than with just the eye roll? <laughs> right, right, right. So I, I don't know who it was that said this, but I saw a quote, or maybe I heard somebody on a call say, it's less about people voting against their own interests than people looking for someone, some party, who mm -hmm. has their interests mm -hmm. at heart. Yes. That's that's the big difference. So, you know, it's easy for for not just city folk, but but liberals and progressives more generally to look and say that, that people are voting, working class generally are voting against their own interests, rural people voting against their own interests. But, but the truth is neither political party in our two party system has paid much attention to these interests at all. Yes. Now, I'm, I'm not somebody who believes that there's no difference between the Dems and the Republicans, especially the modern Republican Party, which is off the rails. But it is true that neither party has consistently addressed the needs, the issues, or the opportunities there. So, right. so I, I think the voting against their own interests, which I, man, I heard that hundreds <laughs> of times during my campaign. Yep. Yeah, you yep. know, from well-meaning folks of who course, really, yeah. you know, didn't wanted uh, wanted to be allies with mm -hmm. the people that they were not. But it really is incredibly condescending. Uh, Erica Edelson points out in her book um, Beyond Contempt, she talks about how the uh, the effects of globalization, as another example of this, for the most part, the professional class and up have benefited from globalization, right? Pretty cheap and reliable source of labor, whether it's nannies or gardeners or, you know, workers in their factory, um, a kind of a cosmopolitanism in terms of food and the exchange of, I mean, all that cool stuff that's, you know, that's delightful, but with almost none of the downside, whereas people in small towns and rural areas by and large don't see those benefits of mm -hmm. globalization, but they sure have seen some downsides from it for, for now, you know, going on 30 years. Mm -hmm. And um, again, so when we say, why do they vote against their own interests? Well, sometimes our policies hurt their interests. Yes. I, I, I'm now, you know, okay, so I, of course, agree that you know, it feels very much like neither political party is responding to the needs of working people, um, including, of course, rural working people. Um, but, you know, people often point out that rural voters in some ways are technically overrepresented in our political institutions like the Senate and the Electoral College. And, you know, there's always a lot of chatter that, you know, the primaries begin with Iowa and New Hampshire, and that's not fair because those states are very rural and they're white. And so they're like not representative of America. And, uh, be and, and we do know that 
you know, many of our institutions in the U.S. are not as democratic as we would like them to be. Uh, does this actually translate to more rural friendly policies at the national level? Because just listening to you, it doesn't seem like that's the case. Uh, what's going on here? Yeah, isn't that the kind of um, most uh, most horrifying of <laughs> uh, of ironies in that yes. it is without question true that rural places have far more representation than they have people in the Senate, in the Electoral College, et cetera. No, there's no doubt about that. It has absolutely not translated into their interests being dominant, even getting sort of a, a proportional share of time yeah. and energy. What it has translated into because of the liberal democratic response to that has has been a kind of a one party rule that has developed in rural yeah. areas on the Republican side. And you know, I have Republican friends in the Virginia state legislature, and every once in a while, there's actually a reasonably good, meaningful piece of legislation, whether it's around rural schools or some some farm policy that they want to pursue. So it's not uniformly negative, but generally speaking, that one party rule um, with an exaggerated political representation of rural communities has not helped rural communities. Mm -hmm. It has not made their issues. It It's made their rage a huge political factor, yes. but not their actual livelihoods. Yes. So one of the projects that Ruby is working on that I'm particularly interested in, and I know it's still kind of in the ongoing and development phase, is you guys are trying to look at progressive and sort of, you know, as you were saying, kind of like from like center dem all the way to like, you know, left progressive candidates who run for office in rural areas and uh, perform well. Even if they don't win, they kind of perform better than you would expect the traditional Democrat to perform. And I just want to give a quick spoiler that you yourself are one of those candidates. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, you ran for public office twice in the state of Virginia on a pro-labor platform. I believe you were endorsed by the Mine Workers Union. Yeah. And um, even though you did not win against your Republican opponent, you did very well in coal country, which it seems like I think for a lot of people who are Democrats would be like a little bit mind blowing, right? Especially since you've already outed yourself as an environmentalist. Medalist. So, um, so I want to ask you about this project. Uh, again, as I said, I know that it's kind of in the early stages of development and you don't have a full report yet, but what can you share with us right now about what you found through interviewing successful sort of progressive candidates who have run in rural areas? Like, what are they doing that seems to work? And can progressives win in Trump country? Yeah. So I think the short answer about can progressives win in Trump country is, or, or the short term answer is generally not yeah, in the okay. short, <laughs> generally not in the short term. I One of the candidate interviews I did, one of our questions towards the end, and I won't say who it was, is um, what would a Democrat have to do to win in your district? And he said, not be a Democrat. Uh -huh. So, I mean, I think there's truth to that, but but we're looking at this, this candidate assessment, we call it, the best practices that we're working on, as tools to slowly but surely make progressives more competitive in rural communities. We don't expect that the findings, which we hope to release midsummer, mm -hmm. um, will suddenly flip the switch and have all of these progressive victories. But now let me say, too, that there are exceptions to this. There are progressive people in either completely progressive or very progressive on sort of economic issues mm -hmm. who have done well in rural areas and won. But for the most part, it's it's a longer term proposal to turn things around, right? So we were I was talking with Cody Lonning, who's the Ruby uh, person that has spearheaded this. And again, just to be clear, what, what we did was Cody looked at um, races in 2016, 18 and 20, U.S. Senate, U.S. House, State Senate, yes. and gubernatorial, and looked at all of them. And um, anybody who ran in a in a decidedly rural district, I mean, some districts are totally some, but a decidedly rural district from the progressive or Dem side of things, and who did better than the partisan lean by at least seven to 10 points, mm -hmm. that that is the pool of people we are now interviewing. And we've yes. interviewed coming up on 40. Okay. Um, I, I checked with Cody and we've actually interviewed people who ran in 22 different states. 
So, so we've got the, the Southeast and Appalachia, the Northeast, mm-hmm. the Midwest, the Rust Belt, and uh, Western states like Oregon, Washington, Utah, all, all covered. Idaho. So, Idaho. Or maybe that's absolutely. not in your study, but I'm from no, Idaho, no, so I had no, to. No, <laughs> no, It is. Idaho, okay, we definitely all right. <laughs> interviewed in Idaho, Idaho, Iowa, the Dakotas, the whole bit. Yeah. So again, it's too early to say for sure, but the teaser, <laughs> the teaser results are, first of all, that it's critical to get the right candidate. Yes. Right. Okay. Now that can mean a lot of different things. Um, but one thing it means is somebody with really strong local roots. Yes. Preferably born and raised there. But if not, at least somebody who's, who for whatever time they've been there have been deeply engaged locally. Mm-hmm. They haven't just been living there. Right. They've been part of the community, part of, of working with the community to solve problems and do stuff. So that's one thing that's uh, really, really clear. Mm-hmm. Um, Wait, I'm sorry, really quick, just for clarification, does that mean they have to be like an activist or is just like a small business owner from kind of the area good enough? Yeah. Oh, in fact, maybe in some ways preferable because, right, sure. it, yes. it, you know, it, again, it's going to vary on the community and the person and how they how they do their activism. But I would say the kind of more old fashioned ways of engaging the community on mm-hmm. the school board, uh, active in in um, local civic organizations, stuff like that. A business yeah. person. Yeah. 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 Right. Farmer. Farmer. Yes. Yes. Um, so so any and all of that. Stuff. So so getting a person who's really locally rooted and has creds in the community across the aisle is is one thing. A second is that they've got to be first and foremost good listeners. Yes. Uh, I remember a Wendell Berry quote. Wendell Berry is a farmer in Kentucky who's one of my uh, mentors and gurus. And he said of basically, not not specifically politicians, but of of kind of development people coming to rural communities to try to save them. He said, we come with vision but without sight. Mm -hmm. So these candidates who do well have a lot of sight. They see what's going on, good and bad, rather than just having their own vision for change, right? So that's that's another really important uh, contribution. And then in terms of the campaigns, what we're seeing, not just the candidate, but the campaigns, again, that that it's a lot of listening uh, at doors, in town hall meetings, uh, being having an open, you know, sort of an open um, phone or otherwise for people to call. When you look at somebody like Chloe Maxman, who who won in a rural district in Maine for the state house and then won for the state senate, Chloe and her campaign were just laser focused on on listening to people um, yeah. throughout the campaign. So that's that's a clear thing. And another characteristic that's emerging, so, so there's this listening respect element. Another is a willingness to be honest about our own party. Yeah. Now, there's there's a, a handful of independents tied up in this matrix, but the vast majority are Dems. And they're, not everybody fits in this category, but the majority of them say they either minimize <laughs> their... <laughs> Dem with a big D, or are willing to candidly say, look, we've screwed up. Both yeah. parties, both parties have neglected your needs and your interests. I said that on my campaign pretty yeah. regularly, much to the consternation of some Dems, but um, but it's, it's the honest truth. And if we're not willing to own up to that, we're not going to open doors to conversations about a better approach. So those are those are some of the uh, characteristics of both the candidates and the campaigns that we're mm-hmm. beginning to see so far. Mm-hmm. And for your own two campaigns, um, re- was your approach sort of? I know that you led with a very pr- sort of pro labor uh, kind of like that was that was your uh, kind of main the main thrust of your campaign, right? And as I mentioned, you you got a coveted United Mine Workers endorsement. Uh, how how did that go over? And did you find that you were sort of? I mean, I guess what I'm trying to ask is like. What issues did you lead with and, and, and like how successful was that? Well, I mean, let's be honest, I got my ass kicked. So, <laughs> so I was successful in the sense that I did better than the Democratic Senate candidate right. who was running at the time. who was well known and well liked. I beat the partisan lean by several points, mm-hmm. but I still lost by a lot. So, sure. I mean, you just got, we got to be honest about that. Yeah, but yeah. but what we did find consistently and what I, I keep hearing four years later, I have mm-hmm. people that do not, I do not know, mostly working folks yes. who will come up to me. And I had a guy 
working on my bush hog. He was a welder. And he mm-hmm. says, are you? I said, yep, that's me. <laughs> right. And he said, well, I don't understand why you didn't win. You're the kind of working guy, you know. So clearly we made some inroads. Mm-hmm. You know, if I was 20 years younger, I, I, I might give it another shot. But I think that the the fundamental message that I did was to contrast the elites who mm-hmm. run the show mm-hmm. um, with the rest of us. Yes. That was it. I, mm-hmm. I, my opening line on my campaign, sort of my main campaign speech was, the rich and the powerful have plenty of friends in Washington already. They don't need another friend. I don't like them. I'm for the working man and woman, and that's right. what you'll get with me. So, And that's pretty much what we did. We focused on local issues. And we tried to... Uh, we tried to focus on them not only in the the rhetoric of the campaign and the little blog pieces and newsletter stuff mm-hmm. we did. We focused on them in the hundred town hall meetings, but we also tried to focus on them in the real world. So mm-hmm. during my campaign, a major employer in Bristol, which is a town right on the southern edge of the district, closed up shop, and mm-hmm. like so many big employers, with almost no notice for the mm-hmm. employees. Mm-hmm. The Republican congressman would not go down to meet with him. Eventually, mm-hmm. long time later, he had a meeting with him. But I went and met with them at their request right away. And we talked through what the issues were. And, and it led to me bringing in a, a friend who was a fantastic attorney who filed a class action lawsuit on their behalf because the company had clearly violated federal law around giving employees sufficient notice. Yeah. And it took three and a half years, but they won the lawsuit. Yeah. So, you know, we tried to put our money where our mouth was, which is which is another characteristic we're seeing in a few of the campaigns that people use the resources of the campaign, mm-hmm. the, the the candidate or staff and volunteers or even sometimes financial resources to actually try to make a difference in the mm-hmm. community while they're going. And we tried to yeah. do that whenever we could. Similarly around black lung. Mm-hmm. We, you know, black lung is uh, has re-erupted in central Appalachia as as a horrific killer of mm-hmm. very young yeah. miners. And mm-hmm. so we we met many times with um with local miners and black lung leaders and and worked with them and continue to work with them to try to figure out how to improve federal policy, uh, mm-hmm. which is really bad around yeah. black lung. So that yeah. was a lot of it. It was partly the message mm-hmm. of a focus right. on bread and butter economic issues, livelihood right. issues, mm-hmm. but it was also trying to actually do stuff in the course right. of the campaign. Right, right. Yeah, I, I want to uh, just focus on the messaging part for a little bit, because something that you had mentioned kind of at the top of the interview was that you feel that sometimes Democrats are a little too focused on messaging or get too preoccupied with it. And I think I agree with you broadly. Um, but as your campaign shows, I think that certain tweaks in messaging, such as you were saying, leading with the bread and butter issues and kind of framing the race as like the elite against the rest of us or vice versa, like that seemed to be pretty effective, all things considered. So um Maybe as kind of a broad question, like, how do you think we can use messaging to sort of move past what we might call culture wars? And then a follow up to that is, do you think that the Democrats in general have learned anything from 2016? <laughs> let me let me start with the second part of your okay, question. Okay. And, and I might forget the first part, so be prepared to remind me. Okay. But I would say there has been some movement. I Mm -hmm. I spoke to the rural caucus of the DNC last week in Washington, and I think the movement has been from kind of denying there's a problem or saying, yeah, there's a problem, but those people, they're hopeless, to where we seem to be now, where is a lot lot of Dems from local committees on up to the DNC are saying, um, we really do have a problem. We really can't win elections Um, unless we have a broader coalition that includes working class people of all colors and includes rural. That's the progress. Here's where they're stuck. And I heard this practically verbatim at the DNC from multiple people who spoke. And and I hear it in the rural urban divide trainings that we do as part of Ruby pretty regularly. And it's this. We just need better messages so those (laughs) folks will understand that we're on their side. Right. That we're the party that cares about them. Right. And and that's where my – so Dems in general are stuck there. And that's where my critique of messaging comes in. It's not that that way better messaging isn't urgently needed. 
mm-hmm. messaging that's not this long, but it's this long. <laughs> right. That uses concrete examples rather than big abstractions. That is free of jargon. Yes. And is focused on kind of neighborly kind of talk. We mm-hmm. desperately need that. But if we think messaging alone is going to change it without looking at what we've done to exacerbate and cultivate the divide, we're shot. Yeah. We're screwed because yeah. part of the messaging is owning up to our failure too. That's mm-hmm. fundamental to the messaging. Mm-hmm. It's it's owning up to the fact that these grievances, while they might be at times exaggerated or the rage might be a little exaggerated, the underlying causes are real mm-hmm. and have not been addressed. Mm-hmm. And because when, once you recognize that and you say, well, what are the underlying causes? Then you begin to realize Dog on it as a party, we better start prioritizing things like this monopolization right. and, and, and antitrust. We better start prioritizing rural communities because not only do we need their votes, but by God, we need what they got. Right, right. We need the food and the fiber and the energy and the clean water and all the stuff that primarily comes from rural communities. Mm-hmm. You know, c- city folks and suburban folks sometimes forget that because everything's at the tip of our fingers. Yeah. But in fact, we desperately need healthy rural places, right? This is one of the messages. So messaging, absolutely essential, but it has to be messaging predicated on a real and deep understanding of how we got here. That's kind of, that's kind of Ruby's niche, right? Right, right, right. is, Is building that understanding and then fostering the policy, the action, and the messages that flow from that understanding. Right. So I think I want to um, just sort of wrap up and end on this question of building that understanding, because um, another interesting project that Ruby is working on is kind of, um, I guess you'd describe it as like a community works project, right? Where it's very, very local and you're getting people from different rural communities to kind of come together and work on local initiatives. Um, Now, I know that sounds kind of vague, but I think that the the, the part that's very interesting to me is that... uh, the point of this project is that there are actually divides within rural communities, mm-hmm. again, between the people who identify as Democrats or liberals or progressives, and then the people who don't. Um, so talk about talk a little bit about the kind of intra-rural divides that you see and how these projects are working to close those gaps. Yeah, that's great. So two, two things kind of um, inspired us to make this one of our three main uh, focus areas, along with the candidate piece and the rural urban divide trainings. One was um, the the fact that, again, part of the current Democratic recognition, Democratic Party recognition of the problems in rural is to say what we need to do is we need more resources in rural communities. We need more signs. We need more volunteers. We need more po- people phoning and texting. That may be true, but again, without an understanding and without concrete engagement, that ain't going to do anything. And the second was actually the the first day of my 2018 campaign. I was in a tiny little town of 975 people, St. Paul, Virginia, a coal town. And I was introduced to the community by two people, the Republican mayor of the town and a Republican member of the Board of Supervisors. They both said in introducing me, that they didn't agree with all my policies, but they supported me because we had worked together to get some great stuff done in St. Paul. So that made me think, well, maybe that's the key, Mm -hmm. is that if if somebody looks at me and says, well, I don't like some of the stuff he stands for, but by God, he's been by our side for the last 20 or 30 years, they're going to have a really different sense of the person as a candidate and probably more openness to that person's ideas. So Mm -hmm. that kind of was the foundation. The same way with the UMWA. Part of why they sort of tolerated my environmentalism (laughs) was because I had been on the front lines of the Pittston coal strike with them and got arrested with them and fought with them, right? So in that, with that as background, what we're working to cultivate, and it's happening with local democratic committees and other liberal groups, is that they not neglect or forget about their political activity, but that they start a whole new branch of activities as the local democratic committee or the local social justice organization, which are about engaging in a non-ideological way to solve community problems. And so some of the activities that have emerged that are either already happening or that people are planning for include very basic things like 
um, working at medical clinics and helping to provide people with access to vaccines or whatever the local medical kinds of needs and issues are. Um, youth activities. One local committee is working on developing um, a fairly significant set of scholarships for local high school students to either attend college, community college, or technical skill school. Um, another is around buy local campaigns. One group, they haven't done it yet, but they're looking at combining forces with the Chamber of Commerce and the Main Street Association to support local businesses instead of Amazon and big boxes. Others are around park cleanup um, or rehabbing homes or buildings in the community. All of those things are the, first, first of all, they're all things that are hard to hate. Yeah. <laughs> but, but secondly, they, they engage people in a way that they stop seeing their neighbors as people who just don't get it, yeah. but they start seeing their neighbors as coworkers in the effort to build a stronger community. We really, we don't know for sure that this will work. We think the, the worst case scenario is that local Dems and liberals will be better informed about the community, better, um, better able to talk to people because when you work with somebody, language becomes a smaller issue. Um, and and good stuff will happen in communities. That's the right. worst. That's the worst case scenario. Right. Exactly. If if we can get all those things and bit by bit rebrand who we are in by, by by this real concrete action so that people start to say, well, you know, they are Dems, but they're they're pretty good folks. Right. <laughs> you know, right. Maybe we'll whittle away at the divide enough to then make policy and candidates um, from a progressive and more more competitive. All right. Again, Anthony Flacaveno is the co-founder of the Rural Urban Bridge Initiative. We're going to go ahead and link the um, link the organization's website in the description box below. Um, obviously, you know, you guys will be producing all kinds of reports and other good stuff in the months to come. So we'll definitely keep an eye on that. Uh, Anthony, you've been very generous with your time. So thank you very much and hope to see you soon. Hope so, Jen. Thanks so much for the opportunity. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.